So let me introduce uh, today's first speaker, uh, Eric Saslow. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce him because yeah, I, I appreciate your recommendation a very lot. So uh, this talk is on uh, frame, uh, framing the one. Thanks. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, <coughs> I'll be talking about trying to work with uh, Lin Mi Shen and also based on a lot of work with David Truman. Um, my goal today is to describe the conjecture, uh, A equals B, so I'll uh, spend some time telling you what A and B are. Um, subsidiary goal is to stick to the script here, so uh, uh, I, it, it may be boring, uh, but I feel that the material is exciting, so that's the choice I've, I've made. So, uh, one side... So, is um, due to Konsevich and uh, Seidelman, uh, uh, who modeled the BPS algebra of Harvey and Moore, described the co uh, cohomological Hall algebra of a curve. So the, we begin with a symmetric curve. Um, d d with G nodes, I'll explain what A is. It's defined by a uh, G by G adjacency matrix A. And this would have to be symmetric integer. AIJ tells you how many arrows between node I and node J, and because it's a symmetric quiver, um, A is a symmetric matrix. Let's choose a dimension vector, D, uh, G tuple of non negative integers. This data allows us to define a representation space of this quiver. Um, I'll emphasize that this is a contractible space, but it has a group action from which you can build some topology. Um, so how do you de define it? Well, for each pair of nodes, you have some set of matrices that attaching to it. A DI, by, or maybe DJ by DI, matrix, and the set of choices are um, uh, how many arrows there are times di times dj. There's no Einstein convention in the numerator. Um, quotient by gauge transformations, gd, where gd is a product of general linear groups, with values in complex numbers, and I'll uh, say again, Note, the numerator is contractible. Okay, from this data, you can define a Hilbert space. Um, it's the sum over uh, the dimension vectors, direct sum over the dimension vectors, which... Uh, which is a discrete choice, and another uh, integer m. In this case, uh, there's another grading, and I'll tell you what that is, hdm, um, are the graded pieces. And this is the sum over d, and the cohomology, the gd uh, cohomology of this representation space. This is a zg uh, cross Z uh, graded uh, vector space. Where M is twice uh, the cohomological degree. Plus this is D transpose. D is a vector. D transpose. Uh, as 1 minus a, 
times d. Okay. So this is a, d is a g-dimensional vector. This makes sense of the number. Um, so the extra gradient is essentially the cohomological degree uh, of this uh, um, of the element. Okay. Um, this has an algebraic structure. There's a ring structure. Uh, there's an algebra structure in this space uh, from uh, the cup product and inclusion of uh, representations. So representations of D1, the dimension vector D1 and dimension vector D2 include in, inside representations of dimension D1 plus D2 um, by direct sum. Into direct sum. But we won't use the algebraic structure. Okay. So that's not part of this talk. Um, I guess I should draw you know, some symmetric quiver because here's one. Um, okay, so from this data, we can define a Poincaré polynomial of this graded vector space, uh, which is called the DT series. For Donaldson Thomas, it's a polynomial in X which is x1 through xg, and a variable for the other degree, q to the 1 half. It depends on a, or qa. Just uh, what you would uh, typically do for a Poincaré polynomial. We have the sign uh, and the homological degree counting. Okay, and so let's do an example. Hope I have enough space for it. Um, G equals one. A equals one. I could could have chosen zero, but let's choose one. Um, uh, D non negative integer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is not a very interesting. Uh, this is the coefficient there. Thank you. Actually, to the script, which has. <coughs> All right. Um, so G equals 1 A, that's this qu quiver. Um, which is D. Um, so in this case, the numerator is just um, C to the D squared. So D by D matrix is what is a representation of that. Um, modulo GLD. Okay. Again, this is contractible. Um, so we're looking at the equivariant cohomology of this um, group. And the diagonal uh, group embeds inside there, which gives you a map, a uh, pullback, into the equivariant cohomology of the diagonal U1 to the D, which is CP1, sorry, CP infinity to the D, so you get polynomials in D 
variables modulo the file group, it characterizes the image of the map I just said, so it's symmetric polynomials. Okay, so the, sorry, those are XIs, I guess. ZI is better than XI, so I use XI up there, so let's make these Zs. And the generators are the, the classes in H2 of CP infinity, the I of CP infinity. The map is pulled back under um, uh, the classifying spaces of these groups. C star to the D to GL to C with image, okay, I have to move over. The symmetric by which our vial invariant um, polynomial. Okay, so now we, we know what the cohomology classes are. We just have to count how many there are in what degrees. So symmetric polynomials are labeled by young tableaus or partitions. Give a basis. And it's um, easy to write down uh, the generating function of symmetric, uh, of young tableaus. Let me make a further simplification. If this, uh, if there's one arrow, oh, I've already made the simplification. If there's one arrow, then this uh, cohomological degree shift, oh yeah, 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 I erased it, which is over here. Remember we had M was twice the cohomological degree. Uh, plus this thing. So this goes away when a equals 1. Uh, so m is the cohomological degree. It's twice the cohomological degree. dt series uh, for this case where a equals x q to the 1 half sum over vn the number of partitions of n, that's the cohomological degree, into d parts sorry, that's, uh, that's the cohomological degree. d labels, which space you're talking about. Um, N is the cohomological the generating function for this is the product over k, and it's q to the k, x. Okay, so that's an explicit example of a DT series for a particular quiver. And let's say note, uh, but Q equals E to the H bar, then the limit as H bar goes to zero of H bar log this thing is the dilogarithm function which says that this thing, um, well, not I, uh, this thing is like an exponentiated dialogarithm function, um, and that's called the quantum dialogarithm. If you haven't seen this function before, it's the sum 
x to the n over n squared. Lee 3 would have an n cubed, and so on. So it's the integral of minus log 1 minus x. OK, that's the um, first part, one side of the conjecture. Any questions? No, I, uh, I, before I, uh, uh, the conjecture would be A equals B, so I, I, I A, we have seen A, but I, I haven't told you um, uh, which part of what I've said is A. In some sense, it's A. <laughs> All right. Okay, part two is um, open Gromov of Witten invariance, uh, a la Aganagic Vapa. Aganagish Klem Vapa, Uguri Vapa, they can go on, Lavastidio, Mourinho Vapa. So, um, but the context will be uh, one that uh, hasn't been studied before, as far as I know. So, uh, let's begin with gamma, a cubic planar graph. So, cubic means trivalent. Uh, Planar means you can draw it in the plane or in the two-sphere. Um, that's a piece of it. Maybe, a, here's a, maybe it's this graph. The edge graph of any polyhedron will work. Um, so uh, Euler characteristic and cubic, uh, this uh, constrains it quite a bit. The number of vertices. Edges and faces are determined by a single number, which I'm calling G. Number of faces is G plus 3 for some G. Okay. So for example, for this one, it has four edges, uh, six, sorry, this has six edges, four faces, and four vertices. Uh, G equals 1. Okay. So that'll be input. Um, from this data, I'm going to construct a, a Legendrian surface. So uh, the Legendrian surface will have a, a wave front inside S2 cross R. For a Legendrian, which I'll call lambda sub gamma. And it lives inside the first jet space of S2. That's where Legendrians like to live, especially ones that have wave fronts in, inside first jet spaces. So that first jet space is T star S2 cross R, which we can identify with the Cosphere bundle of S2 cross R, but the negative directions, the co directions which evaluate negatively against a vector in R. Apologies if, if this is not. Uh, some, some aspect of this conjecture won't be familiar to, to all of us because they come, they, they're two different sides. That's why I'm here lecturing. Um, so uh, the t infinity, the negative directions live inside all directions, and S2 cross R lives inside R3. So this is an open subset of T star R3. So we can think of t infinity of R3, so we can think of the Legendrian uh, living there. <coughs> t star R3 uh, is just a six-dimensional real space. This Legendrian. <coughs> Surface will be a branched cover, branch double cover, over S2. Um, the wave front uh, that lives inside S2 cross R also has a projection to S2, and um, that branching locus will be bigger, and that branching locus is... Uh, all of the graph. So let me explain, uh, draw a picture of what that uh, might look like. You 
have. Um, here's a picture of what it looks like. So there's a picture of uh, a surface, um, nearly immersed, it's almost always immersed, uh, living over, here's a piece of the two sphere, so here's part of S2, it lives inside S2 cross R. Um, it has some, it's branched over where it crosses itself, which is here, here, and here. And uh, there's a non-immersed point where the crossings themselves meet each other. And so this is the local geometry around a vertex of this cubic planar graph. And this is how the graph defines an isotopic class of Legendrian surfaces. Okay. The surface itself um, is not branched over these edges, as you, as you may know from Legendrian uh, wavefronts when you have a crossing, uh, you can distinguish uh, in, this, in, the, in the surface itself um, the two pieces of the crossing. Because the other variable, if we call this uh, qi and this variable uh, z, recall the p variables, the momentum variables, and the cotangent direction of the sphere are just dz, dqi. So the slopes of those crossings um, tell you which is the pre-image. But over here, the slope is 0, so you actually have a, a branching point. Okay. So that says that um, this list, there's 2g plus 2 of them, and that tells you that lambda g has genus g. That's the hard part of the talk. Maybe a good time to pause for a question. So the red part is not branching? Uh, in, in bread, uh, <coughs> this is a branch point, the <coughs> vertex. The, so the, red the red part is a branch for the cover, for the projection of the wave front. Okay, so the actual surface is not branched over these. Just one of the projections is branched over here. But the actual surface is branched over this point here. Other questions? I mean, typically I give the talk, and then afterwards people, uh, people, people will ask questions. So why not ask them now? Other people will benefit from the answer. By the way, I, I should have said at the start, it's great to see a lot of people that I know, but a lot of people I don't know. And I, I'd love to, you know, if you um, come and introduce yourself uh, afterwards, I can get to get to know you, so feel free. So the whole story will be about the contact boundary of the catastrophe. Yeah, so it's some story about a Legendrian surface in the, in the, at infinity in some cotangent bundle of R3. I haven't finished that story, uh, but I don't want to lose everyone along the way. Okay, so um, that's the story. We have this cubic uh, planar graph. It defines a Legendrian surface. What does one have to do with the other? We don't know yet. Um, I also haven't defined any open normal Witten invariants. So let me keep going. From this data, I'm going to define a uh, M gamma, uh, a moduli space of brains, Lagrangian brains with some asymptotic condition defined by this Legendrian surface at infinity. So these are objects uh, in some Foucault category. Uh, I'm looking for what, uh, not a stack of brains, but a single brain with a rank one local system. So that's what that one means. They live inside T star R3. Um, 
They have some asymptotic condition defined by this Legendrian surface. What's the subscript for um, You can take it, uh, the subscript for the. Uh, no, no. Oh, this is this one. Lagrangian brains with rank one local system. Ah. Okay, so uh, there's an equivalence between Fukaya category and constructible sheaves. So I'm going to use that equivalence and write constructible sheaves on R3 with singular support defined by this Legendrian surface. Um, I think it's best to leave that as a black box uh, because even just the definition of singular support is usually uh, a long story. But so there's a black box, there's a category that we define, category of brains defined by this uh, boundary condition and infinity, and there's a moduli space of objects, not all objects, just objects of, of rank one. All objects is too many. Um, so that's a black box, I'll just give you the answer. This moduli space turns out to be the space of map colorings of this picture of gamma, where you choose the colors to live inside P1. That's the color sphere. Uh, so you just color. Of course, uh, different countries have to have uh, different colors. So that's the condition. That's what map color means. Uh, modulo PGL2, which acts diagonally on all the colors. It's a smooth moduli space because in some vertex, near some vertex, uh, you can choose the colors to be 0, 1, and infinity, and that completely nails down PGL2. Okay? There's something uh, called a period map. This moduli space uh, maps into a period domain, P gamma. which are uh, rank one local systems uh, on the Legendrian boundary at infinity. So here's just sort of a sketch. You have some Legendrian surface. Some brain would look like that. Um, if it carries a rank one local system, then you can look at it at the boundary and it will be a uh, rank one local system at the boundary. And so it, that's, what this, that's where this map comes from. Only we have to define it in terms of this, uh, the data of the sheets, and I'll tell you how to do that. So what's the dimension of the It's a surface. It's a Legendrian surface. So the dimension is two real dimensions. Your picture is three. This? Yeah. Uh, I meant to draw two dimensions. Ah, it's dimension it's just the surface. Sort of double potato chip. Okay. Great. Great. Other questions? Thank you, Jan, for asking that question. Uh, so it should give other people license to ask questions that they're feeling or feeling. Or... Okay, yeah, so you can restrict a local system to the boundary, you get a local system on, on, on a torus, which is just uh, itself a torus. Um, Okay, so this P gamma is a tor torus, so C star to the 2G, some uh, you want some uh, polynomy uh, in each, uh, for each loop, but it's not canonically. You have to choose some uh, set of generators of loops. Um, this is a uh, uh, symplectic I mean, H1 of, of lambda gamma is a symplectic lattice if I take coefficients in Z. Um, so this is a torus, uh, sorry, this is a Poisson uh, algebraic torus built from a symplectic lattice. Um, let's just leave it at that. Okay, so we have this uh, category defined by these. Legendrian surface boundary condition, all defined from a cubic planar graph. 
Uh, there's a space of objects in that category that I've just defined, and it, it naturally sits in that something very simple um, algebraic torus. H1 of this Legendrian surface uh, can be written in terms of the combinatorics as well as the uh, co kernel of this uh, map. I'll explain z to the faces uh, from z to the edges. Okay. So each edge of the graph each edge of the graph connects two branch points of the surface. Therefore, on the surface, uh, you can go up and down and define a loop in the surface. Okay? And in fact, that generates H1 of the surface, except when you have a face in the graph, then these three loops sum to zero in the surface because the sum is homologous. So, uh, that explains uh, that faces uh, um, give you a, a, a boundary map, and uh, let me tell you the, what it is. The boundary of the face is just the sum of its edges. Uh, e in the boundary of the face. Okay. So each edge... <coughs> That's something in H lower 1, which pairs with H upper 1, gives you a, a C star value function. So some choice of edges you, you can then use to coordinatize uh, this P gamma. Um, there's a Poisson uh, structure uh, coming from the intersection pair pairing on z to the e on this edge lattice where e dot e prime is plus or one depending on whether they meet um, clockwise or counterclockwise uh, relative to each other. So that gives a Poisson structure Poisson torus. Um, but then there's this condition uh, which says that the actual um, uh, moduli space P gamma lives inside the symplectic leaf. Defined by the equation for all f, the product over the edges of these uh, variables equals 1. Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, yes. What is the relation of your graph and that uh, genus 2 uh, surface? The uh, where, is the, where do you see genus 2? Uh, you, you said loop, right, so edge corresponds oh, yeah. to loop in the surface. Uh, so remember uh, the, this uh, graph on, on S2, the surface was a branch double cover over S2. So if you have a branch cut in between two branch points, it defines a loop upstairs. That's what I mean. Uh, yeah, this is just a, a picture for a particular graph. Uh, the graph corresponding to genus 2 uh, would have, you can do the calculation, it needs to have a uh, um, six uh, vertices so look at that. Okay. Um, okay, so let me define this map. The map And gamma into this period domain is given 
uh, by uh, cross ratio. So here's an edge. These are faces of the graph. So that we have uh, these points A, B, C, D inside P1. Remember that this moduli space is the space of coloring, so this picture. So for each region, we color it with an element of P1, A, B, C, D. Um, and I told you, so this defines part of an element of here. Let's so continue there. And I, I'm going to give you the embedding into P gamma by defining what is Xe. It's just the cross ratio of these four elements of P1. I'll choose that cross ratio to define. It's easy to see that the product around a face equals one as it must, uh, because a, a over b, a minus b will appear in the numerator for this edge, but it would appear in the denominator for that edge of some face. So they all, they all cancel. Okay. So, here's a theorem. It's sort of along the way. This is proved with David Sherman. Um, if gamma is a simple graph, uh, Lagrangian uh, fillings um, I'll give you the proof and then tell you why that's interesting. Uh, proof. The number of points in this moduli space, moduli space is colorings, right? so something studied uh, extensively by uh, combinatorialists, um, only not usually with continuous uh, elements, but if I take, if I look at this space over FQ, field with Q elements, then P1 has Q plus 1 elements. So this is just the number of colorings. Uh, of this map equal to the number of graph colorings of the dual graph. Okay, so we know how many uh, colorings there are, and it's simply too small to accommodate uh, a torus. Torus of dimension uh, greater than or equal to G. What does that have to do with Lagrangian fillings? If you have Lagrangian uh, fillings, you get lots of objects in the Fukai category by putting rank one local systems on them. And the space of rank one local systems is a torus of dimension equal to the first Betty number of the Lagrangian. This Lagrangian will have first Betty number greater than or equal to G, where G is the genus of the surface. So there's just not enough points in the moduli space to accommodate a filling. So there are none. Nevertheless, I somehow do have points in this category, uh, this Fukai category, that uh, on some cotangent, that are related to a category of constructible sheaths. I'll finish the sentence and then could. That category of constructible sheaths was a category of exact Lagrangians. So what gives? Here, there's no exact Lagrangian fillings but we're talking about a category of exact Lagrangians. So that's a puzzle. I'll answer the puzzle, but I'll answer the question first. Um, so you were also considering like FQ star rank, FQ star local systems instead of C star local systems? Yes, in this case, in order to make this uh, okay. proof, yeah, that's right. So how many uh, points are there in a, in a algebraic torus of dimension uh, G over FQ? There's Q minus 1 to the G. And the, the same is simply the, the, what do they call it, the chromatic polynomial of, of a graph is, is larger than that. Okay, so the resolution of this puzzle is that uh, the space of sheaths is a space of complexes of uh, exact Lagrangian submanifolds. And by creating a complex of exact Lagrangian submanifolds, you know, magically, somehow, somewhat mysteriously, we are finding objects that must be equivalent to the non-exact Lagrangian fillings together with uh, bounded coaching. 
So you can make objects out of non-exactly branching fillings. And, um, or you can make objects out of complexes of exact Lagrangians, and presumably these are the same objects. So we're finding a different way through the category of uh, exact Lagrangians modeled by this uh, category of constructible sheaves. Okay, so geometric objects are non exact. Uh, Lagrangian fillings. Which I'll call L gamma. So I should call it L gamma. Um, they're not exact, so they're obstructed, and we can count disks. <coughs> Try counting disks after uh, Aganagich and Bafa. which I'll remind you of their story. So, sorry, uh, for each feeling? For, yes. For each feeling, there are different period maps? For each, uh, well, that's an interesting question. I, I define this period map without reference to the feeling. So, yes. So I don't need to talk about the feeling to talk about the period map. Um, I think what you're probably uh, puzzling over is that if you have different fillings, they must be represented by different objects in, in this uh, category. But there will be overlap between different fillings, as, as you find in, in your work. Okay. Um, so how do Adam and Shabbat do it? They choose coordinates. They do a, a special case of what we're doing, and I'll, I'll remind you here. Uh, and lift uh, to some uh, partial universal cover, m gamma twiddle, inside t star c to the g, so lift c star to the g to c to the g. Uh, and the coordinates um, uh, on the uh, base, are, they call u, c, star, c to the g u. <coughs> Call that a phase. Oh no, this is the universal cover, sorry. I saw the star and thought that something wasn't equal to zero. Um, and the transverse uh, space C to the GV uh, is called a framing. For them, G equals one. What's yes. the rotation C and G? Second one. C to G, this is C to the G. This is, uh, I, I and maybe others, like to tell you what the coordinates are in this space. So here's the C to the G with coordinates U, and here's the C to the G with uh -huh. coordinates V. So U equals U1 through UG. V equals V1 through PG. For Aganaga Shabafa, G was equal to 1, as we'll see. Um, so now uh, I can tell you what these phases and frame, framings are invariantly without coordinates or geometrically. Phase is the map from the surface uh, into the bulk. So the context for counting disks is we've chosen some filling, not exact, and the framing is a splitting, which is equivalent to a transverse set of uh, coordinates there, or a transverse isotropic uh, subspace of that uh, symplectic lattice. So I should say isotropic. Okay. So now what, what do Agon and should have to do? Now try to write and I'm a twiddle as a graph of some function. Function will depend on uh, framing. 
and hope or conjecture as in Gori Bafa, then for any f, for any framing, um, the generating function defined by that framing of x, which is the sum over uh, uh, windings, some coefficient x to the d, where can be written in terms of uguri Bafa integrality, which are which means that this has is expressed as a sum of di logarithms. Okay. So for genus zero verisymmetry, you would say that the generating function of Gromm of Witten invariance should be written as an integer linear combination of tri logarithms. Uguri Bafa found tri logarithm as the appropriate uh, multiple cover formula for disk invariance, where x is uh, going to be plus or minus with a sign dependent on the framing. Um, and uh, these coefficients are integer. And here, ADF is the open Gromov Witten invariance uh, of winding. D and in framing to find by F. Framing was used to define the open Gromo Witten uh, problem uh, by Katz and Lu uh, and uh, is in progress by uh, Solomon and uh, Tukhachinsky for a uh, more general uh, open Gromo Witten problem. And, uh, and we're told that the data that we need, namely this isotopic splitting, is the same as the data that they need to define the open Gromov of Witten problem uh, in general. Okay. So let me run, let me do this for you in some example. It's the example that Agan Agashabhava did, but put in this language. So with David Truman. We did this and verified this integrality prediction of Aguri Vapa for some examples where we could compute low enough dimensions, you can actually compute everything explicitly. Uh, here's one. Oh, this example is also uh, studied by Wu Zhao, uh, but only this example. Not, not uh, the general problem that I'm describing here. Okay, so what's the example? I'm going to take this tetrahedron graph, but I will flatten it so that I can draw it uh, more easily. Um, the moduli space is the pair of pants. Um, why? Because uh, I can choose three of the colors, I have to color this with colors in P1, I can choose three of them to be 0, 1, and infinity, and then the fourth one, which I guess is called Z, in the outer region, can't be 0, 1, or infinity. So it's point in P1, outside three points, is a, choices of Z are a pair of pants. Now what do we do? Now we're supposed to define this period map uh, for each edge. So I'm going to uh, do two edges. I'll do these two. This edge, the period map is some cross ratio, which I'll write down. Uh, what it was? It's an infinity minus zero. You go around like this. Over zero minus one, one minus z, z minus infinity. These cancel, and I get uh, z minus one. But this way, um, I can start anywhere. I'll, uh, 
on either uh, side of it, and I will start at uh, this side, 0. So I have uh, 0 minus 1, uh, 1 minus infinity, uh, infinity minus z, z minus 0, and that's minus 1 over z. Now I need to choose uh, coordinates and a framing. I'll just do that for you. Here the framing is labeled by a 1 by 1 uh, integer matrix. So it's a, a number, which I'll call P. Uh, and in framing P coordinates, uh, this edge is uh, minus x, y, z e minus 1. And this edge is uh, minus 1 over y. So what does that say? Uh, that says that y equals z. And x, y to the p minus 1 is 1 minus z. So that gives us an equation that uh, y plus x, y to the p minus 1 equals 1. This is z plus 1 minus z. Um, and now let's look at that equation. Uh, let's put uh, p equals 1. That says x plus y equals 1. So there's your pair of pants. Um, but it's not just your pair of pants. It's how your pair of pants is cut out in these coordinates inside c star squared. Now, uh, what did Aganagich Vapa do? They had, to, they had to lift to the universal cover. So I have to take the log of these coordinates. So let's write, right. there's a conventional choice of sign here. Right. Y equals e to the minus v. X equals e to the u. Can solve for v, as they do. V equals minus log of 1 minus x, uh, 1 minus e to the u. And what we're trying to do is write down this moduli space as the graph of dw to some, some function. And this is supposed to be a generating function of open gram avoidant invariants. Uh, so w is the integral of this thing. Um, namely, b has to be written as dw. And in dw is this dilogarithm function. So now we've met um, a dilogarithm function in an example involving a quiver and an example involving uh, this cubic planar graph and Lagrangian surface and open Gromov-Witt invariants. So you can probably anticipate what the conjecture is going to be. Uh, before I state it, let me just uh, remark: um, there was no mirror symmetry used here to define this moduli space. So Aganaj Bapa, to define this mirror curve, needed mirror symmetry. Oh, we don't uh, need to do that here. Um, although we saw some beautiful examples of how that can be done yesterday. OK. So now let's talk about this uh, Feynman duality conjecture. I won't be able to probably talk about how to compute anything, but everything can be computed. And I won't be able to talk about uh, the physical reasons why, why the conjecture is, uh, uh, makes sense. Let's the gamma G necklace uh, be. Uh, Be this graph. Where there's g plus one beads on this necklace, and gamma g is going to be the canoe with g seats. So I'm giving you a very particular uh, Lagrangian graph. Uh, so here's a canoe. Note that here are the seats. Note that it happens to be a cubic planar graph. So there you go. Uh, and uh, these are the seats, uh, G 
GCs. Um, I probably won't need the necklace for this talk, given the time. I'll just say it in words. If you mutate along each of the strands in between beads on this necklace, you'll get this canoe. Um, okay. <clears throat> so a framing or lambda g is given by a, a g by g symmetric matrix. Experts uh, might uh, complain, but I'm fixing a phase here. And so the remaining isotropic subspaces are actually defined by a g by g symmetric matrix, which I'll call A. Um, so zero framing coordinates. <coughs> that like chooses, uh, that corresponds to a particular choice, the basis for the edge lattice. Zero framing coordinates would be ui, vi, and framing a, uh, we have the same uh, ui, but vi plus ai, j, uj. And the symmetric condition is the isotropic condition, and this defines the open Gromov Witten problem. on the Legendrian side. Okay. So now we have the same data uh, input into both sides. Where I have a particular graph. That's not changing. Different framings are changing. Framings influence the count of disks. Okay. So those will change, and therefore so will their generating function. The same data A defines a symmetric quiver. And there's the conjecture. Generating function of uh, uh, disk invariance um, in this framing for this particular graph. So that's, that'll be an open question here. Remember, way back when, this psi is the DT series of the quiver defined by that uh, framing. And we verified this conjecture right uh, on the board uh, in the case where g equals 1. g equals 1 is a canoe uh, with one seat, which is the same thing as the tetrahedron graph, the k4, where all four vertices are connected by this. Um, OK. Uh, Gori Bhatta integrality actually follows on the right-hand side uh, from what uh, Konsevich and Sodlin call admissibility of the DT series. This conjecture is uh, most likely uh, can be generalized to all genus, where I don't need to take the semi-classical limit. Um, um, and that's a work in progress uh, with, with Lin Yu Shen. Okay. All right, so I was able to state the conjecture. I think I started three minutes late, so I'm going to maybe take one, one more minute. Um, Bit of a question about what happens for other quivers and graphs. And finally, well, unfortunately, uh, there's a beautiful story that I won't be able to tell, which is that at least on, so th this is the end of the conjecture, uh, but you can still uh, continue to ask about open Gromov Witten invariance for any cubic planar graph. And the, the beautiful thing is that these. Uh, 
Lagrangian subspaces, I'm talking about M inside P, um, glue together as you mutate the graph to get any graph uh, for a genus G surface. Uh, and I think I called it M gamma inside P gamma. But then there's a universal period domain which is a cluster variety indexed, whose charts are indexed by these graphs, and a universal Lagrangian sub-variety, M, such that M gamma is just M for straight to P gamma. So there's a single geometric structure, which actually admits a quantization, defining, conjecturally, all open groma of witten invariants for all of these problems for all framings and any such Lagrangian surface, and in all genus. So, that's it. Thanks. Any questions? So, <coughs> the paper by Sokovsky started with symmetric matrix some quiver, not the, the, the question is, there's a paper by Solkowski who also begins as a symmetric matrix and produces a quiver and not invariance. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know what to say. So, uh, uh, um, investigations al along this line uh, were made by Agen Agic, Ekholm, and Bafa, who consider, consider links. Um, and uh, Knots and the co-normals of those things define different Legendrian uh, tori, but they're always Legendrian tori. Uh, so it's beautiful, uh, but uh, mm, parallel or separate track of investigation. And I'm not sure if his work uh, falls into that class of examples. What's the question about this universal story, which means that you accommodate all possible framings? Yes. So you have a you have this. Uh, this is a cluster variety whose charts defined by Fock and Gancharov. And, and in this setting, Dimovde and uh, and uh, 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 Gabella and Gancharov uh, found this uh, quantum Lagrangian subvariety. This being cluster variety and this being a Lagrangian uh, subvariety, and they admit quantizations and. If you want the open Groma Witten invariant of some Legendrian surface, pick the graph. That will pick a chart here. Then you have to pick coordinates for that chart, and then try to write that moduli space as uh, in terms of uh, function w, and that should be your w.